lot, isn't it? It means we have a healthy worm bin. You see regular red worms, then you'll see little strands of white. And those are all little baby worms. But don't worry, you'll have a chance to get nice and close to them. So, those are the kids here today. Sometimes we adults, we get a little caught up in the details, and then the kids get a little restless. Should this ever happen to you, there's going to be little worm bins set up on both sides over here. As long as your child is quiet and respectful, they are more than welcome to wander over there and keep themselves entertained so that you can focus on what I am saying. Always much more handy. But, obviously, there's going to be some ground rules to that, and that's kind of the start of our presentation is sort of the biology of a worm. Now, is there anyone here, and we have a lot of youth in attendance, so we're going to start this off as an 18 and under question. What is a macro invertebrate? Let's start off with a little Q&A. How about this? The first person, 18 or under, to answer, it's a free worm bin. Oh yeah. Well, how about this? Who'd be the first one to get a free worm bin? Even better. Any guesses? Macro invertebrate? If it takes more than five seconds, oh, we got someone, yes. Invertebrate means it doesn't have bones, correct. It does, it means large, but it's all about perspective. So a micro invertebrate means it's invisible to our naked eye. A macro invertebrate means it's big enough that our naked eye can see it. Now, can we see these worms that I was handing out to you guys a little while ago? Are we able to see those? Yeah, we can see them. Do worms have bones? No. Well, it sounds like we have macro invertebrates then. And macro invertebrates, or creatures without bones, they're very sensitive. And so, when you are at the little worm stations that are going to be over here in these white tubs, you're going to be very careful with them. You're not going to squeeze them. You're not going to crush them. You're not going to drop them on the floor. If your hands have a worm in them, those hands are over the bowl, so if there's an accident, whoops, they fall harmlessly into the little bin with all the other little worm buddies. And so I have a good number of worms right there for folks. And then, oh, look at that. They didn't finish their breakfast. How could they? Remember, kids, you don't get your dessert until you finish all your greens, and the worms are no exception. Don't feed your worms unless they finish the first thing that you have given them. All right, so there's one kit over here, and then I'll tell you guys a little bit more about worms and taking care of them. And I have a nice little cheat sheet right here. The big thing you want to keep in mind is, like with any plant or animal, you want to try to match their natural ha uh, habitat as much as you can. In the case of worms, they live underneath the ground. So you want to keep that in mind when you have your own little worm bin or a large worm setup, is you want to make sure that it stays very cool and very moist, because that's what it's like underneath the earth. It's moist and it's cool. And so I usually tell people, if it's indoors, keep it away from any windows where the sun may go and bake them around the middle of the day. And if you're doing a really large setup, like you've got a small farm or a homesteader, set it up underneath some trees, something with a little bit of shade, especially shielding it from that midday sun. It wants to stay moist. Luckily, worms are smart, and while they don't have any legs, they do know how to get around pretty well. And so they will migrate downward if it starts to get too hot for them. The problem is, if they're busy spending their energy trying to find a temperature that they're you know, happy with, they're not spending any time breaking down the food waste that you're giving them. And so you want to keep things as optimal or as good for your worms as possible. That way they do the job that you want them to do, which is to eat your food waste and break it down into something thick and luscious like the soil. Now a lot of people sometimes ask me, like, how do I know it's working? How do I know when the soil is ready from the worms? Well, let me give you a bit of an idea. This bin right here started off as just this. It was literally just this sort of mixed sawdust with all the mycelium bits in there. By the way, quick aside, that's why I brought mushrooms, not only to hype next week's workshop, but also to show you kind of the uh, closed loop system that I'm doing to keep my worms fed and use the bedding. Instead of going and getting bagged soil like this from a store and using that to put my worms inside of, I instead try to track down what's my you know, local waste stream. In this case, I get these spent mushroom blocks. I harvest the mushrooms, eat them, sell them, whatever. These fine mushrooms will be for sale at the end of the workshop today. 
And then what I do is I take those blocks, I grind them up with my bare hands, and I put them right in there. And now all the little bits of mushroom that don't get harvested, all this white stuff around there that's called mycelium, that's all delicious food for our worms. Worms love the mushrooms. And so your kits today are going to be full of spent mushroom kits, a waste stream that we are recycling and renewing and repurposing to something actually useful for us. And so don't worry if your worms aren't eating super fast when you get these kits because you're basically getting a, I guess you can call it a pre-fed mix for your worms to go home with today. And that's probably why I have a bunch of baby worms as well. Anytime I give them a lot of protein or if you're really hard pressed for food, you can even give it cat food, dog food, fish food, whatever you're gonna see a lot of reproduction out of your worms. So if your goal is to expand and grow out your worm bin, meaning you don't have enough worms and you're starting off with a little colony, try to go with foods and inputs that are really protein rich. And so you can cheat and like I said, add a little bit of dog food in with your lettuce and maybe some mushed up bananas. That gives it a nice balanced meal because just like us, worms want that balanced diet. You're not gonna be healthy if you're just eating carbs all day. You're not gonna be healthy if you eat exclusively fruit. It's that balance of eating fruit vegetables, carbohydrates, fat, protein, that's what makes a healthy human. That's also what makes a healthy worm. And so you want to make sure that you're not just giving it the same single waste stream over and over again. If you're just giving it leafy greens, leafy greens, leafy greens, well, where's the protein at? Worms want some of that protein as well. The only thing is it can't use protein from meat or dairy. And so you have to think about, well, what does have a lot of protein? It turns out cat and dog food is processed enough that even though it does contain, you know, meat product, it's still totally safe and usable for your worms. Otherwise, uh, crops like not only mushrooms, but uh, cruciferous ones, uh, your kales, your cabbages, your collard greens, those are all really good high protein supplements for your worm. And then I always like to put some good sugars in there, so basically any sort of fruit of any sort. In fact, to sort of drive that home, and another activity for the 18 and under crowd, <coughs> we're gonna do a little game called, Can My Worm Eat That? And I wanna remind you guys, that worms are macro invertebrates and they don't have bones. Now, quick question, do you think a creature without bones also has teeth? No. No, no, worms do not have teeth, or at least not teeth like how we're used to using ours. They don't have the ability to grab into something and grind it up. And so what they need it to be is really mushy. When it's really mushy, now they can actually go and eat it. And so mushy things like mushrooms, they really love. And that'll be the first one they give you. This is. I chopped off the caps of the mushrooms, the part that I wanted to eat, and then I took the part that I didn't want to eat, and I'm going to feed that to the worms. A great little protein source right there. But what about eggshells? 18 and under. No. Raise your hand if you think. Can I feed worms eggshells? No. No? You are correct. Too crunchy. And what happens is every single time I see people put eggshells in their worm bin, you check up on that worm bin three, four, five years from now, still gonna have those exact same eggshells still floating around in there. My recommendation, just go put your eggshells in your regular compost. It's not worth throwing in your worm bin. You'll never get it back. How about the ends of stale bread? Is that good? Show of hands, who wants to answer that one for me? Oh, that hand shot up, yeah? No. No? Can't eat it. Can't eat it, why not? Because it, it, it's, uh, it's bread and it's too crunchy for it. Too crunchy? Well, what about if I get it wet? What happens if I soak eggshells in water versus I soak bread in water? What's going to happen? Let's go to the person sitting right next to you with the style and shades. Yes. The bread will become mushy. And so what you would do if you want to feed bread to your worms, pre-moisten it first. Make it nice and mushy. That's a lot of times I do with my food. If there's a little bit of dry parts, I'll kind of pre-soften it for them and make it mushy. Eggshells, though, there's no making this mushy with water. No matter what you do with it, it's a completely different structure. All right, let's keep going. Butts of a celery. Do I have any guesses? Anyone new who hasn't answered before? Yes. Yes. Yes, you are correct. This is fantastic. Sometimes it can be a little bit crunchy, but if this sits in a moist soil environment underneath the ground for long enough, eventually this will get mushy and the worms will begin to consume it. Let's see, do we have anything else in here? Let's see, oh, here we go. What about a burnt piece of egg from the side of a frying pan? This is a curveball. Even some adults aren't going to be able to get this one. I'm not even sure if I have a good answer. What do you think? No? I think better safe than sorry. That would count under some form of meat or dairy product. 
egg is not technically dairy, but probably best not to put that in the worm bin. If you're not quite sure what it is, it's not worth endangering your worms or causing some other weird thing to rot inside of there. So if you're not sure, go ahead and take it out of there and use something else. But if your worms are starving, well, maybe it is worth the risk. Maybe the other bacteria, another little micro invertebrates that are living in the soil as well next to the worms, maybe they can break that down and do something with it. I'm not really sure about that. And then another thing you could do is just take it all, put it in a blender at home and make it into a smoothie. The really hardcore, if you want to go full industrial with your worm bin setup, literally just use your food processor or a food blender like you're literally making a smoothie for yourself. Just you make it for the worms instead. And then a lot of people ask, well, do I just pour it on in there? Do I need to do anything special with it? Do I need to anoint my worm bin with some candles and, you know, kind of play some nice jazz in the background while I eat them? No, nothing like that. What you're going to do, and I'm going to use the bins you're going to be getting today as an example. So what I like to do is you basically, you're going to make almost like rows. And so you're going to dig out one section of your worm bin. Now this could be a little bin. This could be this giant bin right here. This could be a eight foot by eight foot pile of cinder blocks in your backyard that you've dedicated to just make one gigantic worm bin. And you're going to take all the food waste from your farm and your neighbors and just put it all into that one single thing. Either way, it's still going to be the exact same thing. Micro or macro, you're going to make a little trench for it. You're going to take your food waste and ideally you have that nice little smoothie of stuff already done. Me, sometimes I'm a little lazy so I'll just maybe just take my knife and just chop it up a little bit for them. Especially because, you know, that's not going to work, having the food waste just stick out of there. So it needs to be appropriately sized. And this is also where I put the disclaimer that these bins are meant to just be little starter boxes for your worms. It's not meant to sustain a long-term population. This is just meant to get you going until it's finally warm enough out there that you can effectively compost. And so, we put that in there. And then this is super important. We always, always bury our food waste. You want it to be completely invisible to you because if it's invisible to you, it's invisible to the pests that are competing with our worms to eat it. Those pests would be flies, maggots, larvae. Uh, even on the smaller scale, sometimes you'll get like little uh, these gnat things, fungus gnats that'll go on there. And then a really big problem, I think this is the most common problem people have, is on top of the fungus gnats during the summer, but they'll get mold on it. If you have a piece of food, that's just kind of sticking up like an island out of your bin, you will get a lot of mold there. And if you're trying to keep this bin indoor your house, it's not gonna work so good. This bin right here, this bin has been in my basement all winter long. And I have never had any issues with odor. Well, actually, I'm gonna check with the wife. Is it okay. <laughs> See, I wouldn't even know if there was an odor. So if she's okay with it, happy wife, happy life. We're good to go here. And so, once you've trenched and filled that up and buried it completely, well now, next time you feed them, make a trench right next to the one that you just made. And then you bury that. You make another trench, you bury that. Eventually, you've worked your way all the way down across the bin, and then ideally by the time you get to the very end of the bin, whether it be here or here, these worms over here have finished eating their food, and they're on their way, they're basically chasing you. As you're putting your food in, the worms are following along. and so. Depending on the circumstances, depending how many worms you get, the type of food, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, everyone's timing is going to be a little bit different. For me, I want my worms to fit a schedule that's comfortable for me. I'm not doing this on an industrial scale. You know, my you know income isn't tied to how quickly that my worms can process my food waste. So I just feed them once a week, and I feed them enough, and I've kind of figured out over time just how much I need to feed them to keep them happy for that one week. I could maybe fill it up a little bit more and get them to go two full weeks, but if I overfeed, I risk, again, the mold, insects, and other sorts of uh, microorganisms from getting in there and having an issue. And to sort of drive this point home, a quick little story, because I was doing uh, worm composting on an industrial, I guess you could say farm scale, uh, at the university I went to. And there was a uh, frozen yogurt stand that gave us about literally five gallon buckets of just pure fruit uh, trimmings every single day. And what we did is we just dumped in this whole five gallon bucket, just covered it with dirt and just set it and forget it. We figured the worms would get to it eventually. Well, what happened was there was so much sugar, so much fruit waste, that bacteria started to break it down. The bacteria started to generate heat. And then what happened is all the worms in this entire bin 
got nuked. Basically heat stroked it to death because the bacteria was gorging on the sugars from too much food waste all at once. And then we put a thermometer in, it got up to 110 degrees inside of our worm bin. No worms survived the encounter. Only the ones who were lucky enough to be near the extremities to crawl out in time because they're not exactly a fast moving thing. And so you want to make sure, just like with humans, you're not overfeeding your pets, essentially. Otherwise, you may be feeding a lot more than your desired pets. And then vice versa, if you underfeed, well, they're not going to produce. They may not reproduce as quickly. They're not eating as fast. I think you guys can kind of use your imagination of what happens if you don't feed your worms enough. So I think we're good there. So now, on to the next part of your bins. Because I've mentioned, you basically go back and forth, you know, making your little trenches. But what happens when all of this becomes nothing but this? Well, that's why you usually, most people, and if you look online, uh, most worm bins that they sell on Amazon and whatnot, it's always some sort of stackable design. And the reason for the stackable design is, let's say this bin right here was the one that is completely full of nice rich soil now. Well, notice I have some holes drilled on the bottom right there. So these holes are just big enough that the worms can get through. And what that allows us to do is we take this tray right here, and now we start adding the food to this tray instead. We bury it like we're supposed to, and then we place that on top of the tray that's completely full. Eventually what's going to happen is if you're only feeding this tray and you're starving out this tray, the worms are going to figure it out and be like, hey, I'm hungry, where's the food? They're going to crawl up those holes in there into the tray that you're now adding food to, and eventually they will voluntarily leave this bin of ready soil all on their own. And then you can just take that soil and then you can make it into a worm tea because that's a really common thing people ask, like, how do I separate my finished soil from my worms? And that's basically what you do is you plan ahead and you start basically baiting them off early on. And then once you've baited off, you know, enough of them into the other bin, now you're good to go. So I can talk a little bit about that later. Usually it takes about, let's say a week, maybe a week or two for them to kind of figure it out because you want to be slowly tapering off their food and kind of starving them out ahead of time and already putting food in the top maybe two weeks in advance. Like I said, your particular circumstances would differ. If you're putting it somewhere that it's 60 degrees, things may be happening at you know twice or three times as long than someone who's got their worms sitting at 75 degrees day in and day out. And so this is, you know, to us humans, that's just, you know, maybe I'll wear a long sleeve shirt instead of a short sleeve shirt today. But to worms, this could mean that's the whole difference between summer and winter for us out here. That's a huge, huge range for the worms because they're much more sensitive to temperature than we humans are. Because you know, we have this big, you know, nervous system that sort of regulates us. But we're not going to get into human biology lesson. So we have our bins. We figured out what to feed our worms. We figured out about you know, what type of conditions that they like. We figured out how to get the soil out of it. Now the next question people always ask, what do I do with it? I've got this big eight foot by four foot garden bed and I've got, you know, maybe a, a tray full of worm soil. Am I gonna need to go down there and just sprinkle it all around the tray? And yes, you could do it that way, but now let's say you're a farmer. Let's say you've got a whole acre of farm space. How am I gonna get this worm soil dispersed over a whole acre of land. It's uh, logistically, in terms of labor, very difficult. That's where the worm teas come in. And what I'm going to do is we're going to pretend like this is not full of sawdust or anything like that right now, or spent worm substrate. We're going to pretend like this is just an empty bucket right here. And let's say we have our, our finished tray of finished soil. So here I'll finished soil, no pun intended there, to the finished members of the audience, finished soil. So I'll put that kind of on there. All right, so we're all done. The worms have migrated into the other tray. I want to get me some good nutrients. You have a couple options. And that way, if you don't really have much of a budget and you want to do something makeshift, you have that option. We have a uh, pool filter. We have a, uh, I think it's like a, one of those like almond butter or no, uh, almond milk strainer things for people doing their own little kitchen type stuff. And then we have my personal favorite, and actually one of our one of our sponsors who provided the uh, the bucket and also agreed to start selling this out of his business, uh, Risto's Hardware. He supplied the bucket and 
he now offers this and sells it to people who also want to do their own worm bin stuff. So please go support local, go support Risto. Thank you to one of our many sponsors. And I'll talk about some of our other sponsors later as well. I get excited. So we have our soil, we have our paint strainer. And so this paint strainer is gonna fit perfectly because it's made literally for a five gallon bucket perfectly over. So we're gonna pretend it just drop down to the bottom there. We put it on as if we were to use it as an actual paint strainer. We just dump it in there. There we go. And then what we can do is just kind of sit there. We can maybe go for lunch. Maybe we can let it sit overnight. It's whatever. And then when we're done, we just take it out, kind of dangle it. Maybe we give it a little bit of a squeeze. And just like that, you've made worm tea. Now what you've done is you've taken all the nutrients, all the beneficial microbials and stuff that just makes crops just explode. And now you've gone and put that into a liquid state. Now that it's in a liquid state, now you have something you could hook it up to a pump. Uh, going back to you know the farmer with an acre, what do I do? Well, if you have any sort of irrigation, drip irrigation, or pre-existing irrigation infrastructure, just spike that into your irrigation line. And just like that, you're now delivering your worm tea to all of your crops, and you don't have to use any added infrastructure to do it. If you have a pre-existing drip irrigation for your garden, you may need to run it through another filter to make sure you don't clog any of the emitters. Again, you can just put it in there or dump it into a watering can, dilute it with some extra water because it's going to be some pretty concentrated stuff depending on how much water you put in there. For this one tray, a five gallon bucket is more than enough. And then that five gallon bucket, it's way easier to just throw that on top of a four by eight raised bed than it is to stand there with some dirt and be sprinkling it on top, you know, hoping that you're broadcasting it ever so perfectly. And so the worm teas, I think, are fantastic. And then I have right here little air stones. For those of you who have little aquariums, you'll probably recognize this. But basically, you hook one of these up to a air pump, and then you drop it inside of the bucket in the water with the bag of soil inside of it. And then you just let that sit for 24 hours. What you've now done is you've made a basically a compost brew tea, or if you want to get fancy, a actively aerated compost tea. And what you've done now is you've basically gone and taken all the microbials and you've gone and multiplied them inside of this bucket overnight. And that's why you want to brew it. You want to give time for all the stuff that's in the soil to migrate out into the liquid. And so that covers pretty much the whole cycle of doing the red worms from food waste in to ready-made nutrients out. And so now I'm gonna open up to questions, just in case I missed any gaps, and we already got a quick hand over here, yes? Yeah, sorry, I may have fallen asleep for a minute, not not this, but you, when, you more put, than that. when you put the stuff in your bag, mm -hmm. what was in the bucket, just plain water? Yep, just plain water, just like from the tap, not Yep, distilled. fill it up with the tap. Uh, you can do distilled if you really wanna be fancy about it. Um, and then, uh, I forgot to check to see how much they chlorinate uh, water, but if you're worried about chlorine in the water, just let the water sit overnight to kind of degas of any sort of extra stuff that might be in there, and then do your tea inside of it. And that's sort of the budget way you can kind of detox your water. you left water. the bag in there, how long before you considered it one tea? Uh, you can be, if you're pressed for time and you're lazy, you can literally just dip it in there and just shake it around really good, and then just strain it, and then you'll see the results in there really well. If you want to do a proper compost tea anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, again, going back to that little temperature spectrum right there, 60 degrees, maybe you run it a full 24 hours. If you're basically over 68 to 70 degrees, that's when you want to start getting into the little bit shorter timetables. There's a, just a quick aside, so the, I guess the chemistry of oxygen uh, soil and water hold oxygen much better underneath about 68 degrees. Once you go over 68 degrees, oxygen doesn't hold in the root zone or anything like that very well anymore. And so, talk to any, you know, hardcore hydroponic farmer who has to artificially adjust the root zone temperature of a crop, and they'll tell you 68 degrees is the sweet spot. And that's what it is for worms too. If I had a magic wand and you wanted to be perfect, like what's the exact temperature to put the worms at, I'd say put them at 68 degrees. I'd say that is the, whether it's plants or worms, basically anything that makes its living in the soil likes it to be about 68 degrees. Um, at our house, we usually keep it at 68. Sometimes we put it up to 70. Interesting. Yeah, the worms like it the same as us. Cold. 
Yeah, I, I like it a little bit warm as well. That's why I always layer up. Only thing is, worms can't really layer up. What they can do, though, is they have the soil. And so if you are concerned about dips and rises and lows in your temperature, the bigger the compost bin that it's in, the happier that the worms are going to be because it's naturally a much more insulating material. These little bins right here, you leave these in the window to get that sun on that black thing for just five minutes, you're going to have worms trying to escape out. And to sort of rip on that, uh, the most common reason I see people have issues with their worms trying to escape is because they're not doing something right inside of their thing. A lot of people say, well, how do you keep the worms in there? Because with my bin, your guys's has these holes in it that you're going to get today so that you can have them switch back and forth and to also make sure that you don't overwater your worms and drown them as well. But my bin, I have no holes on the bottom and I have no air holes in the top of my lid like yours does because I don't put it on tight. I just kind of leave it like that. You know, if I have my dogs are trying to get into it, you know, I'll kind of shift it over and maybe put like a light weight on there because for me, they just need just enough air. And as long as they have the moisture, the food, and the temperature that they like, they will not try to escape. It's like domesticated chickens. As long as the chicken has everything it needs in the coop, it has no reason to leave the coop. And so you want to make sure that you give it everything it needs so it's a good, happy little camper in there. And if your worms are trying to escape, maybe it's too dry, maybe it's too hot, maybe you're not feeding it the right type of food. I'm not sure. I'd have to, you know, go to every case-to-case -case basis. And that's why it's kind of an art as well as a science. You kind of have to find out what works. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, Alan. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who had three million worms on the south side of Chicago. One of the things that he did, though, was he fed them um, documents that had been shredded and wet. Now, I don't know whether there's a lot of um, nutrients in shredded paper, but the worms did eat it and get rid of it in a sense, but I think he fed a lot of other stuff. So that would be kind of have to be limited, right? Yeah, so in that case, newspaper is almost Basically, it's the carbon source, if you will. So where I used uh, you know, old sawdust and wood chips, they're using the shredded newspaper. They're using a uh, readily accessible waste stream in a urban setting. I'm using a much more readily accessible waste material in our setting. You can go to World of Wood. You can go to any of the timber mills around here. And you could probably go and get yourself a little five gallon bucket of a little bit of sawdust. Or you could even use regular potting soil if you'd really like to if you really must. The only thing about the sawdust is, well, no, it should be okay. Sometimes, like, you don't want to use pure sand for your worms because sand compresses, and worms don't like that compression. They want something that's a little bit fluffy. If it's too fluffy, though, it may not hold the moisture really well. So you want to have a soil mix that looks like kind of a good balance. And for me, uh, you could this bedding should work pretty good for you guys. You could even, well, don't use this soil. This is the library, so I'm not going to steal their soil. But if you want to just take a few handfuls of your home soil and mix that in there, or basically, my personal favorite, at least from a, you know, your guys' scale, uh, potted plants. Old potted plants that have died or maybe transplanted or so they didn't go right because the soil has already been tapped with nutrients because that's the goal of the worms, right? Is to enrich your soil. So use something that you know has already had its nutrients sucked out, like an old potted plant root ball. Not only that, but that root ball has all the old roots in there. That's all a delicious food source for your worms. And that's a lot of times what I'll do is uh, from the, uh, the garden and the farm, I'll take the roots, <laughs> strip them off the plant, and I'll feed that to the worms and make that worm bedding. And then I'll take, you know, the branches and the more stiff, you know, crunchy stuff, and I'll just throw that in the regular compost. And then that way you're kind of picking and choosing and curating your waste stream and actually figuring out what it is that's useful for this and what's better for that. It's Think of it as like when you're refining, um, you know, oil out of the earth, you know. This little section is going towards jet fuel. This little section here is going to be made into tires. This is the section that gets made into your, you know, gasoline. But what I want people to do is start looking at their waste streams like that. It's like, well, we can use, take our paper and we can reuse it and use it over here. We can take our food waste and we can put it over here and use it with that. And really kind of rethink waste as to being a valuable resource that can be used for additional revenue or food or whatever. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I got one. Um, no, it would, like, um, um, are you going to, my gut's telling me you probably want to avoid, like, cedar, pine, like, what, um, sawdust that has a lot of resin in it. Is that for this? Is that, um? You know, I haven't done a lot of experiments with that. And I think as long as you're mixing it 
with some pre-existing soil, it should be okay. If you're trying to use pure sawdust, like pure cedar, yeah, you probably would have an issue with the worms because they do have that sort of mucus membrane coating on their outside that they probably wouldn't really like with that. So I think as long as you're mixing it with soil, because another thing that the soil does is it's stabilizing the, what's something called pH. And we're not gonna get too into it, but basically there's acidic and there's basic. Things like milk are really basic. Things like hot sauce are really acidic. Worms, they don't like it spicy. In fact, ooh, I forgot to add Don on there as well. No eggs and no citrus. No acids, or at least not a lot. They can do, you know, a uh, little orange peel here and there, uh, but I wouldn't go and be squeezing entire lemons inside of there because it throws off their pH. And we're not gonna get too far in pH because we're not gonna make this a chemistry lesson. But one of the nice things about soil is soil has a pH stable